I mean the 9th through the 15th verses and also the 19th and 20th verses. I want to study with you a little while tonight. Thought maybe we might enter into some part of the revelation tonight, but we hold that off a little while. It seems like God has directed us some thoughts here for the benefit of those that may have had problems definitely claiming an experience of salvation. See, the enemy's out working. He's always working. He worked at the time that these letters was written by John back in the first century. And certainly he never quit down through the centuries of time and he's working today. He just had one thing in mind. He don't want men and women to uh, be able to claim an experience of salvation in such a clear manner that they can rejoice in it. Because you get an experience whereby you can rejoice in it, you're going to affect somebody else. Because this is exactly what every honest part out here in the world is looking for. Something that's real, something that they can rejoice in. And so a part of the great battle of Armageddon is against even those who've gained an experience with God to fill you with doubts and fears and bring accusations your way to hinder you from being able to claim the experience that God has for you. Now John had much to say about that in his epistles, especially the first letter. And we just want to study some of the scriptures tonight in a few points, trusting God to bring help to you. First John 5 and 9. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he have testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name. Now this portion of message in the beginning will be to believers that are having trouble believing. This part of John's writing was not to unbelievers, was to believers who were having trouble believing. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is the confidence we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears <coughs> whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we desired of him. Now down in verse 19 and 20. And we know that we are of God and the whole world lieth in wickedness. And we know that the Son of God is come and has given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Now, I'm not spend time in history, but anyone that studies this period of time of the latter part of the first century knows that, that agnostics and other forms and spirits of religion had so moved over the hearts of God's people until many had lost that purity. This is just one of the ways that the enemy works on people. He doesn't get everyone I to go out and commit adultery or drink a beer or smoke. My friend, many people lose their hold on God by just the pounding of accusations of the devil that keeps you full of doubts and fears to the place that you can't truly claim your experience with God. And when you can't claim your experience with God, there's no rejoicing in it. That makes life miserable. And the devil was attacking the people of God 
in this era of time in that very way. And John in his first epistle will be running through some of the chapters, but in each chapter, the essence of his letter was to assure the people that there's a place you can come where you can definitely know you're clear with God and rejoice in that experience. I say, my friend, even as the enemy worked in that first century, my friend, today he's working in the same way, only I feel in an amplified manner. And we just have to face the fact that the uncertain individual tonight, my friend, is in a depressed condition. Uncertainty brings depression. And when depression is there, it's impossible for you to have joy in your work for God. And when it's impossible for you to have joy, my friend, that living for God becomes an irksome task, and the devil knows if he keeps that task irksome long enough, you'll give up in despair, and this is what he has in mind. And too many of my friends go this route. So we feel burdens of the Lord tonight to just deal with you. I ask you to take your Bible, please, and look right into God's a word with us. This condition not only exists right among the people of God here, but my friend, it has so worked over the land and over the religious era as a whole that there's far too many tonight, my friend, that only hope so, or trust so, or even use the expression maybe so. There is many tonight, no doubt, living right in our city that will tell you I won't know for sure whether I'm a child of God and right or not till I die. And brother, that's the devil don't want anything better than that. Because, brother, after you die, it's too late to do anything about it. But there's just countless people, my friend, and far too many preachers will rise up and say, you can't know for sure. And I see a creeping right in among us of using the expression of believing. And my friend, little by little, it's taking away the assured position that God placed the church in. Brother, I'm here to tell you we're saved by faith, but faith brings you to an experience where you know for sure. You don't have to go along the rest of your life believing you're saved. Amen. And this is exactly what John was dealing with. My friend, there is a positive, definite experience of salvation that we can know about. You notice in 1 John 3, 14, and I'll not read the whole verse right now, I'll be dealing with it later, but there he said, we know that we pass from death unto life. They're speaking of spiritual death, the death that God found every one of us in, separated from God, dead in trespass and sin. We know, and I didn't take time to count them up, but there's several hundred times in the Bible the word know is used. Hey, and old Things we can know for sure. John said we know that we have passed from death unto life. I say it appears hundreds of times in the scripture. In our text tonight and all through his epistle, John uses it repeatedly. We know, we know, we know. I read it about five or six times in the text I read to you. Not we hope so, we believe, but we know. We definitely know. Now, I'm not going to preach on the negative, but I do want to lay a foundation for this negative understanding as God will help me make it. There's many things the Word of God lets us know that we don't know. In Matthew 24, 36, 
There he lets us know that we don't know the day or the hour of Christ's second coming. I can mention two or three things that he mentioned definitely that we don't know. We don't know the day or the hour of Christ's second coming. However, listen to me closely. However, the time of his first coming was to be known clearly and was known by many. I can just read a lot of scripture tonight and say, if you just believe this, you can know. But we want to go back, take a little time, and build a solid foundation. And let you to know that every move God made in the terms of our salvation was something known, clearly known, something positive, something definite. There's no guesses about it. I've already stated when it comes to the second coming, none of us know. And it has nothing to do with our salvation, but the redemption of our bodies. As far as our souls concerned, the second coming, coming of Christ won't do a thing for our souls. <clears throat> My friend, it was his first coming that he came to redeem souls. He came to resurrect souls. When he comes the second time, he's going to resurrect bodies. There'll be no soul resurrection when Jesus comes. Whatever condition your soul is in, whether it's been made alive through being born again, or still in a dead condition of trespass and sin, when Jesus splits the cloud, it'll remain that way throughout eternity. So when we think of his first coming, my friend, his first coming was known. The time was known by many people. I'm not spending a lot of time, but you write the scripture down and check me out on it. All of you know that Daniel, in the ninth chapter, there God gave him a revelation. The angel come and talk to him. And the thing he talked to him was about for Christ's first coming. When the time was going to be when the Messiah came. And that word Messiah don't mean to us what it did to the Jews, but merely means a Savior, a Redeemer. And as the angel talked to Daniel, you'll notice there in the 25th verse, the angel used these words, know and understand. But it was something about the first coming of Christ that you could know definitely. The angel said, know and understand. And then went on to tell him, that from the time that the king gave the order for the rebuilding of the old temple, there would be 490 years, 70 sabbatic years, or Daniel's 70 weeks are sabbatic years. You'll just have to take that expression tonight. Maybe we get in the revelation, we'll take it apart for you. My friend, they were to add up 69 of those weeks would lead right up to the coming of the Messiah. The 70th week or the seven years, he would be cut off in the midst. And that would lead us up to the day of Pentecost. The point I want to get to you, the first coming of Christ, my friend, was made plain. The angel said to Daniel, know and understand this. You can know definitely when he's coming. And my friend, not only did the angel say that, and I want you to see it, that those 70 weeks are not filled with what Schofield and other writers tell you, are full with guesses and gaps. Come on, false religionists have taken those 70 weeks apart, and now they tell you they don't know when Christ is going to set up his kingdom. But I'm here to tell you the angel said, you can know and you can understand exactly when the time is. It's a pointed time. And told them how many weeks or sabbatic years it would be, namely 483, my friend, and then right on down the seventh week. Now, those people that lived in that day, they understood this. But we can only get this point across. Those Jews that understood Old Testament prophecy, they understood this. This is why you can read in Luke, the third chapter, the 15th verse. You'll read there. It starts out this way. 
And the people were expecting. Expecting what? Well, the time had been fulfilled. They was expecting the Messiah. And they were so expecting the Messiah that they thought John was the Messiah. Now, how come they thought John was the Messiah? Because they were looking for him. How come they were looking for him? Because the time had been fulfilled. Friend, the point I want to get to you, that everything that had to do with the first coming of Christ and laid the foundation for our salvation was done in a definite, precise manner that man could know and understand. Why was it necessary for that? All of that has much to do with us gaining a no-so experience within our soul. I'm not spending a lot of time there, but I want you to see in Luke 3.15 and also Luke 19 and 11, the people were expecting it there. Expecting what? Expecting the Messiah. Why were they expecting? It was time for it. Daniel's period of prophecy had been fulfilled. So when John come preaching as he did with such power and authority, they said, this must be him. And John had turned around and said, look, I ain't here. The one, when he comes, he's mightier than I. His shoes I'm not worthy to bear. I'm baptizing you with water, but he'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. But the point I want to get to you, they were expecting. What built up their expectation? Because the time was fulfilled. Now you leave that thought with me a moment. I merely want to say that all happened right on the schedule. We can heat scriptures up. The scripture tells us in fullness of time, God sent his son to be born to a woman. When did he do it? In fullness of time. Amen. It was right to the point. There was an exact time for him to be born. There was an exact time for him to be revealed to Israel. There was an exact time for him to die. There was an exact time for him to be in the tomb. Well, there were no gaps or guesses. Everything was precise and positive. I want you to see that God's program in regarding our salvation was a positive program. You'll notice if you write the scripture down in John the 8th chapter of the 14th verse. There you'll read that Jesus knew where he came from, the scripture says. And he knew where he was going. He knew what he could do. And he knew what the devil couldn't do. And because of that, they said he spoke with authority. Now, if you go just a little farther in the 8th chapter, that's in the 14th verse, and you'll follow down in that 8th chapter of John, and you'll find that Jesus was not a philosopher. He wasn't searching for truth. He was truth personified. He finally had to tell them that. But they pressed him to the place, and they held him in the place, and as some of them did the scribes and Pharisees because they upset his relig their religion. He held them in the place, uh, held him in the place of another philosopher trying to find a way. But he just turned around and told them plain, I'm not hunting for truth. I am the truth. I am the way. And I am the life. I say he wasn't a philosopher searching for truth. He was truth. He wasn't a mystic. He was a reality. Now you're going to have to get rid of that devilish thought that the devil puts in the minds of people, basically unsaved people, and he'll also try to crowd it, crowd it in your mind as a Christian, making you doubt whether Jesus really existed or not. And I'm here to tell you tonight he wasn't a mystic, he was a reality. 
And on top of that, I want to say he wasn't a reformer. He was a transformer and a recreator. He didn't come to work something over. He come to make something new. Hey, man, he didn't come to reform man's minds. If he'd have done that, the scribes would have went right along with him. They would have stood for reformation, but they wouldn't stand for transformation. When he began to tell them they were no good as they were. They need to be changed, born again, made new. They raised up against him. Now, not only did Jesus know definitely the truth of his own condition, he knew where he come from, John 8, 14 said, what he was doing here and where he was going. That was all clear to him. And when he got down to the 32nd verse, now we're getting dust, he said, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And they, my friend, failed to understand these words, because they began to say, what do you mean we'll be made free? We was never in bondage to any man. And so he began to bring understanding. My friend, and showed us that he that committeth sin is the servant of sin. The minute you commit the first sin, my friend, your very nature and heart becomes corrupted by sin. Amen. And you become the servant and slave to sin. He began to, my friend, after he got through telling and he knew who he was, where he come from, and where he was going. Then he turned right around the crowd and told them where they come from, who they were, and where they were going. 